Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm really pleased to welcome Jen Capstraw to the stage. Jen is doing our opening keynote. Maximize reach with rad re-engagement strategies. <laughs> Jen is a speaker, a consultant, an email geek. She sent her first ever email campaign in the heady days of 22, uh, 2002. And Jen currently serves as president and co-founder of the Women of Email organization with over 6,000 members in over 60 countries, welcoming queer and non-binary people as well. And also Jen is the co-creator of a podcast that you may have come across, The Humans of Email, which launched earlier this year. So Jen, thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to have you here and looking forward to your session. So over to you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's a pleasure to be here and to be a part of this event. Let me share my screen with everyone. And I love live chat during these events. So feel free during this session to uh, comment. Uh, let me know what you're thinking. Uh, and then there's also that Q&A panel. Look for the Q&A tab. Uh, and uh, if you've got some questions, we'll take them at the end of the session because there's no way I can tell you everything that you need to know about rad re-engagement strategies. Uh, so happy to clarify anything that doesn't quite make sense or you've got extra questions about. Um, but yes, hello, I'm Jen. Big nerd, big geek, love email. 20 years I've been sending email campaigns. Uh, about 10 of those years I've been completely dedicated to the email channel. Um, and as Ruth mentioned, of course, I am involved with Women of Email and the Humans of Email podcast. I also consult for a number of under the radar marketing technology companies in the email space. And one of the companies that I am working with right now is called Alfred Knows. And it is a list hygiene solution. And they were kind enough to host a copy of this deck. So if you'd like a copy of it, you can just go to alfredknows.com slash Mautic. We pr pronounce that Mautic in the United States, but probably a big chunk of this audience is not up this early today. It is 719 in the morning here in Atlanta, Georgia. So yeah, if you want to grab a copy of this deck, um, you can do that. And I'll have that URL in the footer of these slides as well. But I did want to kick things off with an ask the audience poll. So let me launch that. My question to you is whether or not you currently have a re-engagement strategy in place. So let me launch that. Here we go. Do you have a re-engagement strategy currently in place for your email marketing program? And let's see what kind of answers we get. Coming in, the answers are coming in. Wow, a lot of you are not exploring re-engagement just yet. I hope you get some excellent tips and tricks today and you're inspired to get things moving on that front. Okay, so the majority of you are not re-engaging and then a few of you are re-engaging those who are not um, engaged with the email channel or folks who are not moving through the customer journey or both. Terrific. Close that poll and... Ooh, how do I relaunch my slides? There they are. I love these events, these virtual events, but it, it requires a little bit of juggling. All right, so I also asked this same question to my, um, uh, <laughs> I asked a different question actually, to my, my, um, my network on Twitter and LinkedIn, whether or not, uh, at what point they are waiting to, um, ditch the engage, the disengaged subscribers rather from their list. So let's go ahead and launch another poll. I don't see this poll launching. Show on stage. There we go. How long are you waiting before you are ditching your disengaged subscribers? Are you doing it in a short period of time? 30 to 90 days for those of you who are doing it. Are you doing it uh, within about six months, a little bit longer or never? Yeah, about half of you are never deleting and then about 40% of you are deleting within 18 months. A small fraction of you are saying that you are deleting in a short period of time. 
This is excellent, excellent news. All right, so back to my slides. Um, this is great news because when I asked my network on Twitter and LinkedIn whether or not they were, um, at what point they were deleting their disengaged subscribers, I was surprised that so many were doing it in a very short period of time. And I've seen some polls from some industry ESPs that reflected this as well. And I'm seeing a lot of thought leaders advise people to delete their disengaged subscribers who are not opening or clicking in the email channel within a very short period of time, within 30, 60, 90 days. Some are saying up to six months. Um, and so I, I asked my network and I was very surprised to see that my network was kind of agreeing with that. My LinkedIn results were a little bit different than my Twitter results when I reached out to my network. Um, but uh, the, the LinkedIn results here are seem to be reflective of what you folks are saying, about seven to 18 months. And I think that's really encouraging. Um, I'm pleased to hear that because I think that this idea that we need to delete disengaged subscribers rather than trying to have a larger list and generate engagement among that audience, it's very worthwhile uh, to pursue that. And I had the opportunity to talk to a marketer at a brand about this situation. Um, I was looking at their month over month performance of their promotional emails. And uh, I saw that their open rate was dropping off. Now, disclosure, this data was prior to mail privacy protection. And so these open rates were a lot more accurate than the open rates that we have accessible to us today. Um, but what we were seeing when we were going through their analytics was a drop in the unique open rate and the total open rate. We saw a drop in the click rate. And I asked this marketer, what's happening here? I think somewhere around the middle of the year, something changed. Why are you, your performance dropping off in this way? And she said, I got a new manager. And he said, I had to stop deleting disengaged subscribers uh, after 90 days. And yeah, I'm worried about this. I'm worried that these engagement metrics are going down. And I said, you know what? I'm not. And I've got some more slides to show you because your open volume is actually increasing. Your click volume is actually increasing. We can see a rebound after those, those uh, lost subscribers when they stop deleting them, a portion of them are, are back, they're engaging. And most importantly, people are purchasing you are achieving higher conversions. So this is actually a great thing. And you're looking at the wrong metrics by fixating on your click rate and your open rate. You're not seeing the forest for the trees and the opportunity to maximize your reach. And the trick is to reactivate those folks who are not engaging. And also we cannot, um, there, there's a, a metric we cannot quantify and that is inbox impressions. We don't know how many eyeballs are on our from name and our subject line. We don't know how much brand recognition we're achieving in the inbox. And if we were just to snatch that away, then we're losing out, especially if we've invested a lot of energy into building a list. Those acquisition costs are no joke. So we don't want to throw valuable subscribers away and we need to look within. And rather than thinking of them as the problem to be tossed away, we need to figure out how, what are, what are we doing wrong with our strategy and our content? How are we, how could we better invite engagement? A few years back, uh, Jordi Van Ryn and Tim Watson did an informal survey of consumers and asked them, why are you not unsubscribing from the brands that you ignore in the inbox, the ones that you're not opening and clicking on? And the results indicated that uh, about 61% in total intend to convert at a future point in time. The moment's just not right. And this can be applied to B2B as well. According to marketing profs, only about 5% of your audience is ever in market in the B2B space. And that means 95% of your contacts are in some phase of nurture and exploration and getting to know your brand. And so to toss them away is problematic as well. So when you look at the numbers, it's more important to retain 
right? And, and promote greater engagement than to very aggressively prune those lists. All of the advice that's becoming very widespread about trimming lists very aggressively because it's going to increase open rates and click rates, it's bad advice because of course your open and click rates will increase if you trim your list back because logic and math. But as we saw in those charts, what really matters is actual engagement down the funnel. Are we seeing conversions? And if we are looking for conversions, well, then that's the opportunity, right, to, uh, to retain those folks. And I've already bungled our, our surveys today. I've done them out of order. You've already answered this question. And about 70% of you, if I remember correctly, said you don't currently have a re-engagement strategy in place. So when do we typically re-engage? It's when we don't see folks who are opening and clicking our email. And in the era of Apple Mail privacy, it's even tougher to identify who is opening. So we're becoming even more reliant on those clicks, and we've got to get a little more clever about achieving clicks and inviting clicks uh, among our subscribers. So typically, if we're not seeing engagement in the email channel, that's the point in which we want to send a re-engagement campaign. But the truth is there are many, many opportunities to re-engage. Uh, if you are B2B and you've got leads and they're just simply not becoming marketing qualified or sales qualified, they're not asking for the demo or they stall after the demo, those are folks that you want to target. Um, if you've got customers who made a one-time purchase and they've never come back again, that's an opportunity for re-engagement. If you have clients who were once loyal and today you're not seeing that level of loyalty, you want to draw them back in. Anytime that someone is not advancing through your customer life cycle is an opportunity to reach out to them and, and keep moving them along. This is a really simplified, typical life cycle that would apply to B2B and B2C. And if you have a complete email program, you would have a welcome or activation campaign for each step in your customer journey. But you should also have a fallback plan, right? In addition to re-engagement campaigns that are reactivating folks who aren't engaging in the email channel, you want to reactivate them if the campaign that is meant to push them through this customer journey is failing. It's not succeeding. It's not giving you the results that you're looking for. So there should be a correlated activation campaign and reactivation or re-engagement campaign for each one of the steps in your customer journey. So how do we achieve that? I've got four steps for you. I hope you find them valuable today. Um, you want to ensure that you can mail your contacts. Something that I've run into is I've had clients who are sitting on a whole database of leads that have fallen off to the side. They were never able to convert and nobody is engaging them in the email channel. So um, that's problematic because there could be spam traps and bouncing addresses. And if I were to run a campaign to this database of old leads, then that could cause some problems for my deliverability. Um, the second thing that we want to do is grab some attention in the inbox view, right? How do you get people to engage when they're not engaging? I have some tips for that. We also need to be more aggressive in inviting engagement in the, the creative, right? How do you get people to tell you that they are interested? What are some psychological tactics to achieve that? And finally, there are some opportunities to re-engage outside of specific re-engagement campaigns. And I'll show you a really interesting example of that as well. So when you have leads that are potentially... Um, if you've got contacts rather that are potentially old, dusty, they haven't been mailed to in a while, something that you definitely need to do is address it with data hygiene, right? And there are a number of solutions that will clean up your email lists. I mentioned the one I'm working with is Alfred Knows, and I tried it out. I uploaded a women of email list. Um, first, I uploaded our raw database, which I knew contained a lot of bouncing email addresses. And um, I took some screenshots of the results that I got. And I find this really amusing. Look, I got a trash panda and a message that said, you really need to hygiene this list. And I knew that, that this was a list that required hygiene. It wasn't the list we were mailing to. It was just our raw data. And I love that I don't have to spend a dime before finding out what it would cost to clean that up.
Then I tried uploading a list that I knew was good and they let me know this list looks good. We do not recommend cleaning this up. You don't have to spend any money with us. So I thought that that was terrific. So ensure that your contacts are um, healthy and mailable before you start launching re-engagement campaigns to them. If you've been mailing all of your list with some level of frequency at least two times per month, then you're probably capturing all of those hard bounces and you don't have a problematic list. And so you can skip this step completely and just create some re-engagement campaigns. All right, so our second step was you got to grab some attention in the inbox view. If people aren't opening and clicking, how do you get them to open and click? And there's a few trips, tricks rather, at work in these sample um, subject lines right here. So the first tactic we see is the big discount. We miss you. Come back and save 30% off. That's often a strategy to get people to start engaging with email again or to even convert. Um, the 10% offer, <laughs> not quite as enticing, but this is a brand that very, very rarely has any sales. So it caught my attention. The third example here, we see some first name personalization. A lot of folks like to argue that first name personalization in email isn't true personalization. And when it's used strategically, though, it can be very effective, but you want to use it sparingly. And a re-engagement campaign is a good place to use first name personalization in the subject line, or you could even experiment with it in the pre-header to just get a little extra attention and to potentially uh, achieve the engagement that you're looking for that you're not successfully getting currently. And then this fourth example from Pottery Barn, we've got an emoji, exclamation point emoji, action required. We've really missed you. Please confirm. This is a little bit of an aggressive subject line, action required. If I don't act upon this email, what's going to happen? Nothing devastating. Um, but I have used this a, a subject line that's similar to this, action requested, right, with a little first name personalization. And I've achieved really great results by combining those tactics together. Um, I also work with a company called Phrasey, which generates natural language using artificial intelligence technology, and they generate subject lines for their clients so that they can do really robust A-B testing, and they put out a lot of really interesting research. And something that I've learned from them is that the secret to subject line success is actually great variety and mixing it up and being very unpredictable. So if you have a really specific formula for your subject lines, it's always a certain number of words or characters, and it's um, very consistent in the psychological approach, whether you're trying to inspire curiosity or be very direct, um, it turns out that the secret to getting noticed, the secret to getting engagement is to mix it up and have great variety. So if you do have some sort of very specific guidelines for subject lines, toss them out. It's okay to have incredibly short subject lines. It's okay to have really long subject lines that don't even entirely fit in the inbox view. It's okay to have emojis, not have emojis, emojis that can actually amplify a subject line. So if you've got a really great subject line, it's going to draw some extra attention to it. A really crummy subject line, it could backfire a little bit, but the secret is to be unpredictable. So experiment with that in all of your email campaigns, but especially with re-engagement. You've got to grab that attention if you've got folks who are just not engaging with the email channel. Another strategy to get attention in that inbox view is to use humor. And I love this example from Avis. Have you been captured by aliens? And then the pre-header is tell us it's not aliens, right? This is delightful. If you're not engaging with this brand, you want to know, okay, what's inside of this email? And here's a peek at it. Um, and this is also an example of that third step that I mentioned, inviting engagement in the email creative. So we've got Avis, you know, with the, the whole alien theme. This is a great hero image here. And oh, thank goodness you're safe. You haven't been engaging with our emails, but we know that you haven't been abducted by aliens. Do you want the emails to keep coming 
we see this strategy frequently, giving folks the op opportunity to opt out if they'd like uh, or to confirm, yeah, I do still want email. But what I also love here is that there's a secondary call to action. How about an upgrade, right? So we're not just asking them to confirm that they want to keep email coming, but we're inviting an opportunity to create a conversion with this campaign as well. And this is an example from email on acid with exactly the same strategy. We've got these multiple choice engagement buttons. Do you want email to keep coming? Yes. Maybe you don't. Maybe the answer is no. It's okay to put that no button in there and drive people to the unsubscribe or to a preference center maybe where they can opt down and have a little more control over their relationship with you. Maybe there are certain campaign types that they don't want. So um, with the no, you can give them that opportunity to unsubscribe and or opt down and out of specific campaign types. And there's an opportunity to potentially retain them. And then we've got that third option. I want to start a free trial. So driving them toward the conversion, even though they haven't been engaging in the email channel. I like to call these multiple choice calls to action, uh, magical multiple choice buttons, because when you ask your audience a question and you make it really easy for them to answer it with just one click, then there's a higher chance that they're going to engage, that they're going to give you some information that you are looking for. And I mentioned I've applied that subject line strategy with action requested, with some first name personalization. I also applied yes, no buttons as well. Yes, I am still interested. No, I'm no longer interested. And I did have one campaign that achieved a click rate of 6%. And a 6% click rate on any email campaign is a pretty incredible click rate. But to get that on a re-engagement campaign with an audience of leads that were completely disengaged, that also is pretty amazing. Now, the majority of those clicks said, no, I am no longer interested. And that is good, good information to have. Uh, in this case, I was working with uh, folks in the higher ed vertical, and we could have had a landing page that asked for more information. Why are you no longer interested in this educational program? Is it because you have um, decided to go to another school? Is it because uh, you don't have the financial capability to attend? And by gathering additional data points, there could be some opportunities to build out more email campaigns that are very specific toward the needs uh, and the challenges that they're having that are preventing them from converting. Uh, I also, this is a, a, an example of something else I did with that higher ed vertical. Um, when we were reaching out to leads that had not uh, converted, the problem was they were trying to convert leads by phone. You had to have a call with the admissions office in order to become a qualified lead. And so the outbound calls, there was a finite period of time legally that they could call and folks just don't like to answer the phone. So we used email to reconfirm their interest and we also needed to get them to opt back in so that we could continue to outbound dial them. And so we uh, implemented a personalized landing page. So not only was our email personalized, you know, with some first name personalization, the specific program that they had showed interest in, um, but the landing page also had that information. It had a unique phone number that they could call so that we could track the success of the campaign for inbound calls. But we pre-filled the lead form that we needed them to resubmit because we needed a new opt-in to start dialing them again. And we saw a conversion rate of 69% one month uh, using this strategy of a personalized landing page. And as I mentioned earlier, re-engagement is not just for folks who are not engaging in the email channel. It could be that they are engaging with email, but they're not moving through the customer journey. Uh, I like this example from Splice. It's very simple and to the point. This is an application for folks who are musicians so that they can share their music. And you have to uh, go through a whole process of registering, and then you have to download the application to a computer. It's not a phone app. And so a lot of people stop in their tracks at that point. But because they have captured the email address, they can re-engage and remind people, you can download this application at this time. Let's proceed. You know, you got the ball rolling. Let's keep moving.
This is a terrific example from Kohl's. You've got a customer who has been a returning customer. They're engaged with email. However, they made a return. There's been a disappointment. They don't want the jeans that they returned. So how about engaging them and saying, hmm, maybe these are more your style. Sorry, those didn't work out, but let's, let's re-engage. Let's see if we can get that conversion on the jeans that we lost because you made a return. This is really clever personalization. And you know, um, you, we've got abandoned cart and abandoned browse campaigns, abandoned form fill campaigns. All of these are technically re-engagement campaigns. Even though folks may be engaged with that email channel, they're simply not moving through the life cycle. This is one that I got from Thrive Cosmetics. I was really interested in their mascara. They put out tons and tons and tons of ads on social media, and I wanted the long, luscious lashes that the models were getting. And so I gave some thought to making that purchase. I put it in my basket and I got the abandoned cart message. If you are uh, B2B or in some kind of lead gen space, abandoned browse is a great way to, or abandoned uh, form rather, is another way that you can achieve re-engagement. Um, but there's one other thing that you can do when you've got folks who are engaging in email, but they're simply not moving through the customer life cycle. And that is get some of your other campaigns to invite that re-engagement behavior that you're looking for. So for instance, if folks are engaging with promotional messaging, but they're simply not converting or they had an abandoned card, abandoned form, abandoned browse, you could then uh, put the re-engagement messaging into the email campaigns that they are currently engaging with. And I happen to have a conversation recently with Garen Hobbs, who is the Senior Vice President of Evangelism over at an application called Zambula. And I asked him, uh, what are the strategies that you are advising to your customers to achieve re-engagement? And it's exactly the strategy that I've just described to you. He said, folks get fatigued by these re-engagement campaigns, the standalone re-engagement campaigns. They are important to create, but they're not always successful. So when folks are ignoring the re-engagement campaigns, you can invite re-engagement outside of the re-engagement campaign in another engagement campaign. And he sent me this example from Thrive, the company that I got the abandoned cart message from. Now there's a lot to take in on this slide, so let me break it down for you. What Zambula does is they create a number of standalone banners. And then based on data points on the customer, um, you know, the behavioral data, have they previously been a loyalty customer? Have they made purchases before and so on? Based on that, this decision engine decides what is the most important banner I can put at the top of this email, and it drops it in right there at the top of the promotional message. So this is a dynamic element, and it's up high, it's up above the fold because it's the most important message they can send at that moment in time. So this is a promotional message about some new products, but there's an abandoned cart there, right? Don't leave that cart behind. Let's re-engage. So if you're B2B, maybe you're sending out invitations to webinars that folks are very interested in or thought leadership, blog posts, and that sort of thing, but they're not asking for a demo or they're not following up post-demo. You could drop in some extra messaging up at the top of the messages that they are engaging with to try and drive the behavior that you are looking for. So in this case, only two of these banners were specific to re-engagement and they drop it right in at the top and they're seeing a lot of success by doing the standalone re-engagement campaigns complemented by inserting re-engagement re messaging into promotional messages. So what are our takeaways today? Don't prune those lists, don't shrink them, keep them large, but keep them healthy. Re-engage. Think about what, what is failing in terms of my strategy and my content? How can I reactivate their interest in my brand? And rather than just cutting them from your list, let's keep the list large and let's keep them engaged. Now, I'm not saying you should never prune them, but 
you should give some thought to how you can reactivate before you take the drastic step of removing them from your list. You also need to be sure that every, everyone is mailable, right? You don't have any spam traps and so forth. So if you have leads and contacts that have been sitting stagnant for an extended period of time, you have not been mailing them with frequency. And my recommendation is at least twice per month for the least engaged segment and hopefully higher frequency for the folks who are engaged and aren't in need of re-engagement. Um, you need to clean up those lists and you can use any variety of uh, data hygiene solutions, including Alfred Knows. Then you have to invite the open and the click. You've got to get a little more creative about how you are going to get folks who are disengaged to actually engage. And achieving that click with those multiple choice buttons is a great idea. You could even ask questions such as, why are you not you know, advancing to this step or that step. If you were B2B, for example, maybe you've got multiple choice buttons that ask, um, you know, hey, you showed an interest in our products, but you haven't asked for a demo yet. What are the reasons for that? And multiple choice buttons. Is it because you decided to choose a different brand? Is it because you don't you aren't ready to make a purchase? Is it because you don't have the funding? When are you planning to make a purchase? Whatever information is valuable to you, you could drop it right there into your email and ask that question and get that data point. And there's a psychology of response at play there. If you make it easy to answer the question, they often will. And then there are those opportunities to cross-promote re-engagement. If folks are engaging with the email channel, but they're just not moving through the life cycle, you can drop in some messaging into the campaigns that they are engaging with and let them do double duty and see if you can achieve the re-engagement and push them through that customer journey that way. So thank you so much. I hope you got some good tips and tricks today. Whew, it's early in Atlanta. Uh, I am going to take Q&A if we've got any. I know that Ruth is going to pop back in here. And if you have additional questions about uh, re-engagement, I am going to be, after the Q&A, jumping over to the, the table for track one uh, and hanging out for a while. And we can, we can DM there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jen. There were so many knowledge bombs dropping in that session. I was like frantically writing notes. So really appreciate that. And I'm sure everyone else has uh, really learned a lot from your session, especially like the bit where you were saying it's not just about sales. Like you can also look at re-engagement from the product perspective as well. Like if they're not using the product in the way that you that you want them to, or they're not coming down the customer journey the way you want them to. So yeah, loads of insights. Uh, okay, we have a couple of questions. I'll bring one up to the stage. So this one's from Robin. What about email reputation with spam filters and services like Gmail? Um, we're told to stop our sending reputation declines if we don't have good open rates. So what mm -hmm. do we do there? Um, that is an excellent question. Uh, you can decrease the frequency in which you're sending to that less engaged segment. So a minimum of two times per month. They don't have to receive every email, but you do want to keep your brand recognizable in the inbox. And you do want to capture any kind of uh, bounces. So continue to send, send at a lower frequency until you get the engagement you're looking for. And then you can then increase that frequency. So um, it is important to have good engagement for deliverability reasons, but if you are not having any deliverability problems and you don't have any crises that you need to triage, then there's not a good reason to not mail that segment at all. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer. I'll mark that as answered. And we had one other, which I answered, but I just want to double check. What was the AI tool for subjects that you mentioned? So I think it was Phrasey. It was Phrasey. Here, I'll yep. drop it in the chat so you can. Awesome. Phrasey.co. There you go. It's Phrasey. Um, and it is a very fascinating technology. It is appropriate for higher volume senders. Um, if you are not a high volume sender with loads and loads of contacts and a big hefty budget, then you will still get tons and tons of value out of their research, their blog posts, and their newsletter. A lot of great insights for all marketers. Fantastic. Thank you. And one from Joey. 
How do clicks compare to opens when it comes to reputation growth? Is click equals email open or more worth? Yeah, a click is far more valuable than an open. And something that I didn't mention that's even more valuable than a click or an open is a reply. So mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to do no reply messaging. You want to make it easy for someone to hit that reply button and uh, let you know what they're thinking. So you could literally have a campaign that's a part of your re-engagement strategy or even your onboarding strategy or both where you're inviting a reply, but you do have to be prepared to uh, manage those replies and reply yeah. to your replies. But that is such an excellent, excellent signal of engagement. And it's so valuable for your deliverability. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think we had a session in November talking about that and about the fact that you do have to actually respond to those replies, but we can do that in Monte. So that's a really good point. Thank you for raising that as well. Yeah, okay, and I've but, seen some really interesting strategies where uh, uh, the full campaign, like an onboarding campaign or re-engagement campaign, and you've got unique messages throughout where most of them are HTML, but then there's one in the middle that's primarily text and it's from a human, right? And mm -hmm. it is automated, but it's from the person or the team that's going to do the replies. And often yeah. when you use that strategy to invite the reply, uh, it performs even better. I've heard a lot of marketers say that's often the best performing message in their complete campaign is the one that invites the replies. Awesome. So some really great advice there as well. If there are any other questions, we have uh, a couple of minutes before we have to close out for the next session. So do use the Q&A. Um, I had a question for myself, and that was, how long should we keep going at this re-engagement before you actually decide enough's enough and you're like, OK, right, we really have to give up now? Do you think there is a point where that needs to happen or is it uh, just a case of? Probably. Most likely there is a point in time in which you should slash people from your lists. Yeah. Um, there are some brands, some large legacy brands that will mail you for all of eternity. Uh, I've got like an old Yahoo account where uh, there are brands that I subscribe to around uh, 2004 or five, and I almost never check that account and I'm still getting promotional messages there. It would be a good idea for them to trim me from their list. But the point in time that it's appropriate for you to prune is very mm -hmm. dependent on your vertical and the length of your customer life cycle. So mm -hmm. if you, for instance, are B2B and you've got a very long journey, you know, from the point of interest to actual um, purchase and delivery, then you want to hang on to your contacts even longer. Um, and as I mentioned, according to marketing profs, only 5% of your audience for B2B is ever in market at any point in time. So keep engaging them for an extended period of time. Ask them if they want to remain on the list if they are not engaging with that channel. But um, if years and years and years have gone by, probably a good idea to trim them without any engagement. Um, but it might be a little bit shorter if your sales cycle is short. So you really have to think critically about your situation mm. and what's appropriate and put yourself in that customer's shoes. What if mm. it was you? Uh, there's a brand that I subscribe to that has um, STEM projects for kids. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. a parent. I'm an auntie. So mm. I'm subscribed because I want to give these educational products to my nephew and nieces. However, I'm not going to engage with those emails unless there's a birthday coming up, unless mm. it's the holiday season. And so these, these messages are coming and I want them to keep coming because I want that brand recognition. I want to remember that brand when the time comes to give a gift. So it's really mm. valuable to exist in the inbox. We can't quantify the value of those inbox impressions. So I would love to stay on that list for a very, very long time. They have already trimmed me. So <laughs> fortunately, they're still top of mind for me. Um, but if you cease to exist in the inbox, it, you can be forgotten. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so there's no right answer for when you should trim people, but um, you know, if you are selling a retail product, it, it may be multiple years before you want to do that unless you are seeing some very serious inboxing issues, you've got deliverability challenges. Um, another mm -hmm. exception would be if you have got 
contacts that are um, maybe not from the best source. If you can look at the origin of your various contacts, if you see that certain segments perform better than others, maybe there's a quality issue. Um, I know that in the EU, you've got some very strict opt-in laws. In the US, mm -hmm. things are a little squidgier. And um, sometimes <laughs> there are salespeople who are um, putting people into CRMs who maybe um, have not explicitly opted in. <laughs> That's a bit problematic. <laughs> Yeah, I think that basically what it comes down to, I think, from what you're saying is like understanding the customer and understanding why they might want to continue to hear from you and also having a sense of how that fits with your brand, your your business cycle, right? Your business processes. So, yeah, know the customer and know your business, I guess, and make the right exactly. decision based on that. Exactly. So, no one knows awesome. your brand better than you. No one knows your audience better than you. And put some faith in your own judgment and critical thinking mm -hmm. skills. Go with your gut as a starting point and you can refine yeah. and, and optimize from there. Awesome. That's really great. Thank you so much, Jen. It's been really wonderful having you opening our um, event with the opening keynote. And I think everybody has really learned a lot from your session. So very much appreciate you getting up super early <laughs> just to come and join us today. Aww, and thank hopefully you, you can go and have a bit of a nap before you start work. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Hope everyone enjoys the event. Yes, and you'll be over in the lounge for a little while. You mentioned on table one in case people want to want to chat about anything that you've mentioned in the session. So fantastic. exactly, I've just got to find my way there. So I'll be Okey there momentarily. Dokey. All right, thanks everyone for joining, and we're just going to close the session. So see you later. Bye.